Okay, so hello everyone. Thanks for joining this webinar on um, biodiversity net gain. So again, yeah, thanks for joining. So now over the next hour, we're going to kind of give you a bit of a first principles introduction into what biodiversity and net gain is from uh, myself, Ross Primit and Imogen Player. We're both consultants at Action Sustainability. We've then got a series of guest speakers. So we'll have a, a section from Nick White, who's the biodiversity strategy manager at Natural England, talking about legislation and, and how there are going to be some key changes coming up in the not too distant future around biodiversity and net gain. We'll then have a, a short piece from Julia Baker, who is the biodiversity technical specialist at Balfour Beatty, talking about how to implement net gain at project level. And then we'll have a kind of net gain and organisation perspective on net gain from uh, Neil Strong, who's the biodiversity strategy manager for Network Rail. After each section, we'll have a kind of a brief point for each of our speakers to address a couple of questions, and then we'll have a kind of sum up and, and closing questions piece at the end. So again, this will be the introductions. Just to give you some first principles around biodiversity, because I'm sort of conscious that it's one of those topics that there's there can be quite a few bits of terminology around it. So you know, when we talk about a species, it's a, a type of plant or animal. So an example you might encounter on a construction site could be you know the common badger. A habitat is the environment in which that particular animal lives. So, for example, a badger might live in the woods. An ecosystem is the kind of community in which those groups and plants and animals live and interact with each other. So, you know, again, you might have deciduous woodland and within that um, a badger performs a number of functions that kind of generates nutrient cycling, carbon cycling, that kind of thing that makes that whole system work. And then biodiversity is the term which describes the number of species or the, the variety of life in that ecosystem. So, for example, within the UK, deciduous woodland is a highly biodiverse ecosystem because there are lots of species that, that live within it. And, you know, to cut to the chase, you know, why is biodiversity important? So, you know, we're all part of biodiversity and, and we are dependent on a healthy and biodiverse world for maintaining like, support, support systems. So, you know, at basic level, that can be things like clean air, clean water. You know, more specifically, you know, you might say that the Amazon rainforest locks away carbon, reduces climate change, you know, regulates local climate through transpiration. You know, pollinators like bees are responsible for, for producing the kind of a lot of the food that we eat. It's interesting, you know, that we can put numbers on it. Bees might be worth £651 million to the UK economy through the, the services that they, that they provide. And, you know, from a physical perspective, salt marshes and mangrove swamps protect our coast and Erosion and, you know, more, maybe more out there, things like, uh, you know, we, 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 get, um, we potentially might get treatments for COVID-19 through antibodies in llama blood. So, you know, there's a lot of value that, that a diverse world brings us. And one of the things that's becoming more apparent is in the period 1970 to 2014, you know, studies have shown that 60% of animal populations have declined and we're actually now considered to be living in a mass extinction event. And by having a less biodiverse world, the species around us are less able to cope with the changes that, you know, our, our way of life is actually causing to the planet. And just now to kind of jump to um, the biodiversity mitigation hierarchy. So this is how we think about um, how we reduce our impacts to biodiversity in construction. So this is essentially saying that on a construction project, there is an impact to biodiversity. As a priority, you know, by looking at how we run that project, the first thing we need to look at is avoiding that impact. Once we've considered, you know, the maximum amount we can avoid, we then look at how can we minimise that impact. And then once we kind of looked at how we can um, minimise as much as we can, then we then look at restoring habitats. And then once we've looked at restoring, and um, you know, if we can't do that anymore, then we need to look at offsetting. And then hopefully a combination of those things then leads to a, a net gain in biodiversity for construction projects. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to my colleague Imogen to talk about net gain. Thanks, Ross. So I'm also just going to give you a quick introduction to what actually is net gain. So biodiversity net gain is where you leave the environment in a better state than it was before you started development. So after the project or site is completed, it should have an increase or a net gain in biodiversity compared to before the site or project development began. Previously, you might have heard of the term no net loss, which is when any areas developed should have no loss of biodiversity. However, net gain is really about improving the biodiversity through development compared to before the project development began. So net gain can be achieved through schemes that provide an overall increase in natural habitat and ecological features. But a really key thing here is just that you must apply the mitigation hierarchy first. So just a reminder of what Ross just said previously. 
So why is it relevant to the construction industry? Well, there's a few reasons. The first is for statutory requirements. So as part of the government's 25 year environment plan and the environment bill, developers will have to make sure that a biodiversity net gain of 10% is achieved on developments. So there's also another couple of reasons. So client requirements, you may start to see this showing up more in your client requirements, as well as requirements and questions for working in the community. So particularly on any large projects, you might see some requirements for working in the community. So whilst we've told you a bit about why it's relevant to the construction industry, we'd really like to hear about why you think it's relevant to you and what you'd like to get from this webinar. So we've got some, some things coming up on the screen now. Great, so we're looking for insight and knowledge innovation, practical ideas, actionable points, update on legislations, simple process guidance, lesson sharing, more practical advice, some best practice examples, winning bid ideas, measurement tools, actionable steps, how to actually implement biodiversity net gain, principal contractor requirements, UK wide action, and how to work with other people. So there's a range there, but looking at best practice examples, guidance, perspectives and ideas, which will hopefully will now cover quite a lot of your answers and your and what you'd like to get from this webinar during the session. So I'll pop back to the presentation now and I'll hand over to Nick. Many thanks indeed, Imogen. My name is Nick White. I'm the principal advisor for NetGain uh, within Natural England, which is the government advisor for the natural environment. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about legislation, what's changing, and why this might matter to, to you in your work. But before doing so, I just want to kind of reiterate some things that are already out there and already in, in place. So, so biodiversity net gain is already in the national planning policy framework. It was updated last year, um, includes some uh, updated guidance around it in terms of planning practice guidance. So it's a useful thing to look at. Um, just before the election last year as well, MHCLG, so the, the government ministry uh, for homes and uh, local communities, published a national design guide as well, uh, which also includes uh, details around biodiversity net gain. And also within a couple of national policy statements, uh, particularly that to do with new nuclear and water resources, uh, also talks about biodiversity net gain. And you'll see it increasingly implemented at a local plan level as well by local planning authorities. So the planning authorities currently have a mandate uh, to introduce biodiversity net gain locally through their local plan. But the main change that's coming and, and the one that Imogen was alluding to is around mandatory net gain. Uh, and this is in relation to the Environment Bill, which is currently in Parliament. So this is a quite significant piece of legislation. It will apply to England only. Um, and what it does, it has the effect of amending the Town and Country Planning Act. And it introduces a requirement that all developments that go through the Town and Country Planning Act are uh, must it, uh, do so and achieve a minimum 10% biodiversity net gain. And they must all use the same metric for measuring that net gain. So it will be based on what's uh, described at the moment as the biodiversity metric 2.0, which I'll, I'll come on to. The bill requires that any habitat delivered either on site or off site should be secured for at least 30 years. And the bill actually has a spatial delivery hierarchy within it. So, so when Ross was talking about uh, the kind of mitigation hierarchy, what the bill emphasises is that it expects any project to firstly consider and seek to achieve net gain on the site in the first instance. It recognises that's not always possible. And so where that can't be done either wholly or in part, you are then encouraged as a, as a project to look off-site by the purchase of habitat units from local landowners, which could be NGOs, could be farmers, could be, could be a range of organisations. If that's not possible, so if you can't do any net gain on site, and equally if there's no one with land uh, able to sell you the kind of biodiversity outcomes you need, the bill also makes provision for the establishment of statutory biodiversity credits, which are credits you could buy from government. They'll be invested in biodiversity gain outcomes, but they're intended to make sure that there aren't any situations where a project is stuck, it can't achieve net gain on site, and there's no local way of uh, delivering net gain. So they will be available as well. Any landowner that's interested in providing land for developers to purchase and, and units from uh, and be available for biodiversity net gain, so anyone that wants to enter into the net gain market, must uh, provide uh, habitat units that are registered on the net gain register. The bill is also unlikely to become law until early 2023. And so at the moment it's in Parliament, uh, there's a two year transition period and it'll be introduced in 2023. 
couple of things to stress. The bill doesn't change existing legal protections and it doesn't apply to nationally significant infrastructure projects or to marine. So just in, quickly in terms of the process, so this diagram seeks to describe it. So drawing on industry standards and guidance and uh, making reference to local strategies around where people see priorities for net gain, a development would use the metric uh, in conjunction with a site survey to establish whether they can achieve net gain on site or not. They would then look to either submit their proposal and submit their net gain plan to say, I can do it on my site. If they can't do that, then they buy any shortfall from the local market. And if they can't do that, they have the option of buying statutory credits as their means of achieving net gain. And that's the process that, that a development would go through. So the, the bill has three and uh, four key themes. Uh, firstly, that net gains are measurable um, and it's using this uh, standard metric, which I'll come on to. Secondly, it has this element of a spatial delivery hierarchy. So this idea of achieving net gain firstly on site or locally and, or through credits. It also seeks to ensure that net gain delivers not just benefits for nature, but also for people, so the local communities and kind of process benefits for the planning authority and developer. So it's intended to, to make the whole process more consistent and more transparent and, and more objective. But equally, it's doing that without replacing existing uh, environmental protections or legislations which still need to go through usual licensing, etc. routes where, where needed. So where is the bill? So it was introduced to the House of Commons on the 30th of January of this year. It reached the public bill committee stage when COVID impacted it, as well as many other things. The bill committee hasn't yet started kind of rediscussing the, the bill. So um, we're expecting the bill committee stage to start picking up discussions imminently. Looking at raw assent in 2021, so spring 21, which would mean with a two year transition that it becomes a mandatory requirement in spring 2023. Meanwhile, a lot of the bill comprises secondary legislation, which the government is currently working on, and some elements of that will be consulted on next year. So, so something to look out for for the next year. I mentioned this is all, uh, a lot of this is based on the use of a single uh, consistent metric, biodiversity metric two. It uses habitat features as a proxy measure for wider biodiversity and then translates that into uh, a language of biodiversity units. So it doesn't consider species, it doesn't include indirect impacts. It measures all types of habitats, including intertidal and rivers and also green infrastructure features such as green roofs and walls, etc. So, so any habitat type can be found in it. And it bases a calculation um, on the size of the, the habitat uh, or its length, its condition, its distinctiveness, where it's spatially connected, uh, located and how ecologically connected it is as well. And it comes with a free calculation tool. We published a beta version, as is in Natural England, of the metric in July of last year, and then that went out to consultation, and that consultation closed in February. We've been working on the responses to that, and we recently published a, a kind of summary uh, response to the, the consultation. And we're looking to release the metric, re-release the metric in its final form uh, in December of this year. It again, will come with a free calculation tool, as well as uh, summary and detailed guidance and revised condition assessment methodologies. At the same time, we'll also be releasing a test version of a metric for smaller sites, so essentially a simplified version of the main metric that's for use for, for smaller developments, and that will be going out to consultation in December of this year. So, so why is this relevant? So it's important just to stress that any development on the Town and Country Planning Act from spring 2023 will need to achieve this minimum 10% biodiversity net gain. And local planning authorities may locally vary that percentage upwards. So everyone will need to be familiar with the biodiversity metric because that's the metric that everyone will need to use, landowner and development developer alike. And developers will also need to submit a biodiversity net gain plan alongside their, their net gain calculations. Planning authorities should provide information about where their strategic biodiversity priorities are. Ultimately, that will take the form of local nature recovery strategies, but there may be other equivalent documents in place that are used in the interim, such as green infrastructure strategies or biodiversity opportunity areas. People already are, but it's important to start thinking about embedding biodiversity net gain into the design process as, as early as possible. Uh, it's often the easiest way to achieve net gain is, is by getting it in early and thinking about it early. And there's already some existing uh, guidance and advice available uh, to refer to. So the Triumph of Syria Saim and Saim and Aima publishing guidance uh, uh, fairly recently, which is being updated. 
early next year, the British Standard for Biodiversity Net Game will be coming out and also expect to see a more detailed government advice coming out over the next couple of years as well. A couple of other developments just to quickly uh, reference. All of this has been talked about terrestrially. There's now a great interest and appetite to uh, take forward marine net gain. Uh, so work is beginning to start now on what net gain for marine might look like and the development of a marine metric. Equally, although nationally significant infrastructure projects aren't covered in the Environment Bill, a number of individual operators and schemes are committing to, to biodiversity net gain. And, and we are expecting, as MPSs get updated, there to be an increased focus on biodiversity net gain for, for NSIPs. The 25 year environment plan also emphasised that government's ambition is for environmental net gain. Uh, that remains uh, their objective. And there's a pilot metric being developed to help uh, measure to you know, move towards that called an ecometric, and that will be published early next year. And then also just to draw your attention to the recent planning white paper. So lots of changes proposed for the plan, planning system. But again, it, some of the things it emphasises are on strategic solutions, the importance of design and sustainability, idea of zoning and, and everything moving to digital. And, and again, that will feed across ultimately into approaches for net gain and, and sort of be embedded into that as well. So that's my contact details if anyone wants to get in touch. But otherwise, Imogen, back to you if there's any questions. Yes, we do have a few questions coming through. So the first one is... Is there a particular reason that marine projects aren't covered or are there separate laws and metrics for them? Yeah, so the reason marine isn't covered in the bill is the bill uh, only relates to town and country planning act developments. And basically they only take you down to the mean low water mark, so they don't extend into to wider marine. That said, there's a recognition that actually it would make sense to include wider marine over time. Obviously the, the, the sea doesn't sort of end at, at, the, at the end of the seashore and so work is now starting on an approach to marine net gain for, for English waters. We don't quite know yet what form that's going to take but obviously a number of projects will have uh, connectors coming ashore so a, a, an offshore wind turbine for example have connectors coming ashore. It would make it would be sensible and that those two systems for net gain do interact with another and are nested with one another as well. So, so yes, the, the marine approach, I expect we'll learn lessons from terrestrial and, and we'll need to work with the terrestrial system. Great, so the next question is, if you have no biodiversity on site, for example, no existing buildings with no green, existing buildings with no green roofs, et cetera, how is the 10% measured? It's a very good question because obviously 10% uh, is zero, but will always be zero. And so there literally is nothing on site. It, it's, it, you can't use a percentage mechanism. Our advice to planning authorities in that situation is to request a minimum uplift in biodiversity units or the amount of, of, of biodiversity they'd like to see, so yeah, an area increase, for example. In terms of the bill itself, there will be more details set out in terms of whether there's any minimum thresholds against which it applies. Um, so. Uh, but it ought to be, if you've got a site that's literally got nothing on it, one of the easiest scenarios in which to achieve some sort of net gain uplift because obviously anything would be better than nothing. It's just you won't be able to use the percentage as a mechanism. So what will be the new arrangements in relation to protected or priority species? So the arrangements don't change for those at all. So it's still with it, yeah, they still retain their existing protections. We'd still go through the existing licensing or other regimes for those. You would need to include information about those and what you, how you are addressing their needs as part of your wider biodiversity net gain plan that you submit to the planning authority. The metric is quite simple, so it doesn't it doesn't consider species itself, but you still need to deliver you know, meet those needs separately. Great, thanks. I think we've got time for one more question. So what is required now and what can we ask for now and in the transition period? So for a local planning authority, the fact that net gain is in the MPPF that allows the planning authority to set local requirements for net gain. Some already do that. An obvious one that often gets referred to is Warwickshire, who've been essentially operating a net gain system in Warwickshire for a number of years. It will depend on the detail of what's set out in that that local authorities' plans as to what their minimum expectations are. And you may find some planning authorities that have no expectations. 
equally, you know, we're as an organisation, we're encouraging people to be thinking about and embedding that game. I know a number of companies have already got internal kind of KPIs as well that they're they're working to achieve. So, so partly it will depend on what's your business's objective or what's the project's objectives that it may have set itself. And equally, is there anything the consenting body is asking for? And if it's a planning authority, they've already got scope to be requiring biodiversity net gain. And if they do, I would encourage you to be seeking as much clarification from them as to what they're, they're expecting, so what metric to use, how much net gain, questions like that. Thanks, Nick. I think we'll now pass over to Julia. Great. And good afternoon, everyone. So let's have a think now about biodiversity net gain, particularly on a construction project. And my work as well for BC is very much sort of construction focused. I'm going to be talking through kind of three top tips, if you like, in terms of biodiversity net gain on a project level. But I do want to emphasize something that Nick mentioned. This is what we do in industry. You know, we, we always ask, what does good look like? What's the benchmark that we work from? And in 2016, the good practice principles were published by our three leading environmental professional institutes, uh, so the Chartered Institute of Ecology, IEMA and Syria. And all of those good practice principles apply as one bundle. So it is very much to take all of those throughout a project and to apply them. So thinking about all of those, when you do get to a project site, my kind of three top tips. The first one actually starts off with avoid and reduce. You know, it just makes all the sense in the world because, as Nick mentioned, most of your life with biodiversity net gain will be a percentage increase. So the more that you take away, the more that you've got to give back. And avoid and reduce is just the go to starting point for any construction project. Now, I work a lot on transport networks. And we are really, really firstly fixed in terms of our work location. That's the road that we're either improving a junction or that might be the railway. So it's, it's a fixed location, but I'm always incredibly surprised about what we can do when it comes back to avoid and reduce. And there's a couple of really some practical advice that I want to run through with you. Firstly, the engineering solutions now are far beyond what they ever were. And the difference between, you know, the slight levels of slope on a, on a, on a cutting or an embankment can really make a difference, just the amount of habitat. And when you start to quantify that habitat loss, as Nick mentioned through the metric, it can make such a difference to your 10% net gain. But the real point that I want to make with avoid of juice is to start this as early as possible and to involve the contractors makes such a difference. And I, I've seen this time and time again, when contractors are involved early, it's that brilliant coming together of the engineering excellence in design with that buildability knowledge to really work on those solutions. But also we need to factor in all of the temporary works. Temporary works, you know, you have your permanent works design. There is always temporary works that come across it material storage, temporary roads, temporary drainage, all of those things, we need to think about that as early as possible to really make sure we're hitting that avoid and reduce. And just to run through a couple of examples. So the, this was a couple of, uh, the, the embankments had already been designed and it was a landscape bund. And our, our Bocatra looked at that and it was a particularly special tree that we were like, no, come on, you know, we, we've got to be able to do something there. So he just drew these, he, he just drew them out just to start the conversation, just to have something on the table to go through. We got our engineers from the construction team, we got our sub agents, we got the landscape designer on board and it is this cross disciplinary look, you know, we had to get the drainage guys come on board, but because he started that conversation, we could then actually change the design and retain that tree. So it is possible, absolutely, but this was quite late. We did it, but it was a lot of retrofitting. So it's so much smarter and more efficient if you can bring these ideas onto the table early and if you can bring the contractors on board early. Another example, sort of top left in, in the red circle there, that was actually an existing patch of woodland and it was marked down for clearance because it was a material storage area and then replanted with woodland. So we were just like, look, okay, what can we do here? 
So we explored all possibilities of that. And there was another option further away, but that involved pretty much doubling our whole road use of vehicles. And it was much nearer the local village. And that was just too much of a trade-off. By the time that we doubled our vehicles going up and down and the disturbance to the local village. So we don't win everyone that we try and put on the table. And you know, we live in a world of construction, which is all about finding that middle balance. And we didn't win that one, but that doesn't stop us from trying. And the, the picture on the right hand side, one of our project managers was absolutely keen on this. And he was challenging the construction team to look, put your temporary works into the permanent work footprint. Let's really work with this. And they all took it on board so brilliantly. And I got this email from one of the agents and that's the email that I wanna get. He'd found that and he worked out a solution. And we did, you know, he really owned that savior, you know, that, 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 that saving that piece of habitat. So it's, it's a, a really joint effort when it comes to construction anyway, let alone with this first point about re avoid and reduce to bring everyone around the table, particularly the contractors. So avoid and, and reduce, we, we've got to work as a team and there is stuff that we can do, even when we're working with very tight spaces, even when we're working with a fixed footprint, such as a road or a railway or energy or housing project. Consider all temporary works. They always, always come up, always. And we've actually used a lot of BIM modeling to feasibility test what we're thinking about. But also when you get to construction, things change. And we need to respond to that change as best as possible. So using the innovation that we have can really help. And the final point is to measure the wins. And that kind of relates to number two. So Nick mentioned the metric and I love it. I have to say, and a shout out to Natural England. I think they've done a fantastic job here with the metric. It's so important to use this in terms of a decision making tool, I'm still seeing this get left behind. I'm seeing design kind of progress and, uh, you know, work along and then the metric comes down a little bit down the line. We've got to use this as early as possible. And Nick kind of went through this, but I just want to highlight really what it does in, in a very, very simple way. So on the left, we have a look at the habitat before works. And this generates the units that Nick was talking about. Then we have the habitats after works. And again, all the factors that Nick talked about, it generates the units after works. So there's a lot behind the metric, but we're essentially looking at the difference before and after works in habitat types. Now I'm gonna come back to this point, but we've got to use this as early as possible. When we had that word cloud, people were asking for practical advice and action tip, it's this. Don't wait for the magic source of perfect data. You know, I, I spend my life on Google Maps, even more so under lockdown, but use it as early as possible because the metric helps make decisions and we, we, we don't want to leave that too late. And there's a couple of particular points here that yes, and while I love the metric, it, it there are a couple of glitches and I'm sure Nick will, will recognize this in, in the existing format. So use it, use it as a decision making tool, but also use it appropriately. And the couple of other key points here, the design to construction handover in terms of the metric, in terms of the digital data, in terms of the habitat data is key. I've had so many painful discussions about GIS systems that don't match up or CAD systems from a designer, from a contractor. So another bit of practical advice is to have that conversation early. Use the metric as early as possible and also use it as a live tracker during construction. Things change in construction. I've never worked on a project that hasn't changed. So we need to keep track of that changes to respond. But also, I, you know, I work for Balfour Beatty, so a contractor. We're being increasingly asked for an as-built metric. So that, that's a as-built, that's the data as we built it, that's the data that we collect. So that's a change. We need to collect the data during construction that can be used to produce an as-built metric. The other thing about the metric that I like is that it gives us a sense of really red flags. So we know that irreplaceable habitats 
and certain statutory designated sites are not part of biodiversity net gain. But the metric will score very high distinctiveness habitats as well. And you can see on the slides there, any loss is unacceptable and it won't even calculate your units. It comes up with errors. And to get over that, you have to click a box that is bespoke compensation that you've achieved. Now, I've used this at a very early stage and the contract, uh, the, the developer actually avoided that habitat because he didn't want that. He didn't. He, his version of bespoke compensation was time and cost through that conversation and discussion with Natural England and the local authority. So because I showed that to him early, we were early enough in the process to really change his design. So the metric is invaluable in that sense. And my, my third top tip, if you like, when I go around to construction sites, the, you know, the one question that I'm always asked is, okay, Julia, you, you talked a lot about this, but what, what do we actually do? You know, what does this actually look like on a construction site? And this is actually when it's really, really simple. Yes, okay, we've gone through the mitigation hierarchy and we've applied the metric, but on a construction site, we're either going to be delivering more habitats or we're going to be making existing habitats better. And that's it. That's what it comes down to. Now, I'm not talking about all the protected species stuff. As Nick mentioned, there's no change there. I'm talking about net gain. So no matter what you're building, no matter where you are, it's more or better habitats. And I use that phrase. I, I use it with our site foreman. I use it right up in terms of our senior executives because that's what net gain comes back to. So that's the final point that we're looking at. We're either making more habitats or making those existing habitats better. So when it really comes down to a project, take all of those good practice principles, all of them, and that's what our benchmark is to measure ourselves against. But my kind of my, my three top tips, if you like, avoid and reduce, get contractors on board early, get everyone around the table and come up with those joint engineering solutions that can really make a difference. Use the metric as early as possible. Be transparent about how the, I was going to say data limitations, but, it, but in my world, it's how rubbish the data is or if it's OK from Google Maps. But measure it, measure your progress, measure outcomes, use the metric as early as possible, don't wait. And then finally, finally, we're doing habitat stuff. You're, you're making more habitats or you're making existing habitats better. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. We've got just a few questions coming in. We've got, well, actually, we've got loads of questions, so we won't be able to answer them all, but just a couple for you, Julia. So the first one is, how are temporary impacts that may be mitigated by new habitat creation taken into account in the DEFRA metric? Would it count as a loss and then a gain? Yes. Yeah, good, good question. So the metric does account for direct impacts only, and that direct impact can be a temporary loss or it can be a permanent loss. So if it's a temporary loss, you do record it as a loss and then there's a tab for habitat creation. So if you're planting, say, for example, you've got to remove some habitat for a material storage area like the one that I had or for an access road and then you're replanting afterwards, record it as a loss and the replanting afterwards comes under creation in the metric. So it does definitely count. That's great. Thank you. And the next question is, when a project is restricted by a client DCO and the contractor has no or little input, how can the contractor ensure that biodiversity net gain is applied before work commences? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know who answered that question, but I get that all the time as a contractor. You know, it's so frustrating when we're brought in late in the day. and We can have these great engineering solutions. It doesn't stop me from bringing them to the table, even if it's, you know, too late, because that might be something that the client takes to the next project. I mean, things always change in, in, in construction, but we try to proactively engage our clients as early as possible. Even if we, you know, we're not yet appointed, we're still issued some biodiversity net gain options or something like that. So we're, we're at this interesting phase where there's such variation around the country, but it's really for us to put it on the table as early as possible and then work with what we've got. You know, I, I, we, as I mentioned, we don't win every victory that, that I want to go through, but it doesn't stop us from trying. And the moment then when we get to the actual construction, I've had clients commission biodiversity net gain halfway through construction just because they, they get it. You know, we're the ones who brought it to the table, so anything is possible. 
Thanks, Julie. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. So the next one is when looking at the matrix and the metrics as a client, if you're finding it overwhelming and complicated, who should you appoint to carry out the assessment at early planning stage? Yeah, it, 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 a really good ecologist, basically. I mean, it is all about habitats and does require that those skills and expertise by an ecologist. So I would look out for the ecologist there. There's training by the Chartered Institute in the metrics um, and also just really great ecologists who really understand habitats and are, are brilliant at surveying just the habitats themselves and the condition assessments. So a, a good skilled and qualified ecologist. Thanks, Julia. And the final question, do you have any advice for net gain opportunities on refurbishment projects which have limited options? Oh, gosh. I mean, the, the amount of green walls and we've got a new thing on one of our project instant hedges which which are which are my new google search of choice and green planters i mean just the amount of different green infrastructure that's coming through now different rain gardens and things like that and they all add up you know the, the metric does count for all of this so i you can get really inventive and really creative and i, I don't know exactly what you're looking at but Definitely have a look at, at the, the innovations that are coming out of the landscape sector now for, for green infrastructure, because there's loads of interesting stuff out there. Thanks so much, Julia. That's great. I think now we'll pass over to Neil. Hi, uh, thanks, Imogen. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for waiting on for me. So I'm Neil Strong, Biodiversity Strategy Manager at Network Rail. And over the next few minutes, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a perspective from an organisation's point of view. And... Just to put it into context, if, if for those of you who aren't aware, this is the coverage of our, our estate, the whole of Great Britain. But if you squash our land into a small ball, you end up with something about the size of the Isle of Wight and a half, which is 52,000 hectares. So massive opportunity for biodiversity across that estate, covering as it does the length and breadth of, of Britain. What I'm going to do is just take you through the last 200 years of the railway in one slide, which basically starts off in the top left with Stockton to Darlington, and then looks at how the railway managed its estate over the last 200 years, starting off with basically the, the PP of the time of uh, tweed and flat caps with guys with, with sides and sickles managing the estate, managing the, the wildflower grasslands, and the reason being so that if there were fires, they were cold fires and the whole embankment didn't start burning. But as technology came through the railway, diesel trains, electric trains, the perception was that that vegetation management wasn't required as much. And then we move into electric signaling systems. There's less cables using the 74 signaling approach. So the vegetation tended to get closer to the railway than it had ever been at any point, especially the, the large woody vegetation. And what that brought about over the last 20, 30, 40 years is an increase in the number of incidents. Those three pictures in the middle there, one with a train uh, that's hit a tree, the obligatory leaf on the line, which we'll be coming into in the next four or five weeks with autumn coming, and then derailments caused by vegetation. Luckily, we haven't had tree-related derailments for some time, but obviously everybody will be well aware of the issues we've had recently up in Stonehaven. The reaction then was that vegetation was bad and therefore needed to be managed, and in some cases quite severely. And that shot in the middle is of Hadley Wood on the East Coast Main Line, which was one of the sites that raised this to national level, to the views in the Palace of Westminster. And the gentleman at the top is Boris's little brother, Joe, who was rail minister in the middle of 2018 and actually said to us that we needed to stop all of our vegetation works because they were not convinced that we were managing it properly and were not taking biodiversity into account. He asked the gentleman at the bottom, John Varley, to get involved and to do an independent review of what Network Rail does with its vegetation management. And John took uh, six months and published the, what is now known as the Varley Review. And that set out a number of recommendations for the rail industry. The first recommendation, there's no icon for it, was at the Department for Transport. And they were told basically to give us clear policy on how we should be managing our vegetation. But essentially what the Varley Review found was that we needed to have governance in place across the business to understand what was going on with our estate. We needed to manage the, the asset as an asset and to value it as an asset rather than as an, as an issue. We needed to look at having an ambitious vision for our, uh, for our work. We needed to get better at communicating with our stakeholders, not only the, the, um, the industry and the train operators, but also our line side neighbours 
of whom we have 7 million direct neighbours across the railway. And we needed a culture change within the industry to make sure that people didn't see biodiversity as, as something extra to do, something that got in the way, but it was actually part of the day job. And what that then resulted over the period from the publication, the review was the DFT setting the policy and then us coming up and with a response to those recommendations. And part of the recommendations within the DFT policy was that Network Rail as an organisation had to achieve no net loss of biodiversity on its estate by 2024. And then it had to work towards setting uh, to achieving biodiversity net gain on its estate by 2040 within the policy. And one of the issues that we have with that is that we need to understand what net is before we can start working out what uh, net gain was. And that came up in one of the questions. If you've got nothing already, then what is your net gain? We obviously have a lot of biodiversity and we needed to establish a baseline. And so what we are doing at the moment is working with the Center for Ecology and Hydrology to understand what our baseline of biodiversity is, understand where the habitats are so that we can make an assessment of that biodiversity and work forward to then understanding how we are impacting on that. And it's not just the, the difference with our estate is that it isn't so much the, the development, this is the routine maintenance that we have to undertake in order to make sure that trains can run around safely and that the people who are working on the railway are doing that in a safe manner as well. And the approach that we're taking to understand and to measure that biodiversity, we cannot, and there isn't the resource across Britain to have ecologists across the railway network undertaking detailed surveys. There just isn't the, the resource, there isn't the money, and also we don't have the time to, to do that. We are looking at particular methodologies, and as I say, we're working with CEH to remotely survey the rail network, those 52,000 hectares, to, so that we can do this safely, we can do it without having people in the vicinity of trains, and then we will then take people onto the ground and to ground truth that data so that we can make sure that the information we're getting that enables the managers to then understand and to start programming works. And as Julia says, so that we've got it up front so that we know what we've got before we start doing the work and then look at the way that we do the work so that it isn't necessarily a complete clear fell of a section that might be a particular issue during the autumn, but it's actually managing those trees further back from the line side, opening up, having more open space close to the railway lines, close to the overhead power lines and moving the trees slightly further away. Alongside that, one of the recommendations from the Valley Review was that we needed a biodiversity action plan. And this is due to be published towards the end of this year, again, working with CEH. And it is looking to reverse the decline of the biodiversity that, that Ross talked about earlier on, that we, you know, we have a number of different types of habitat across the railway. We've obviously got a lot of woodland, but there is opportunities for having those species rich grasslands that are in decline and that you know we can manage on our side of the fence and you know less disturbance potentially there's no public access on our side of the fence so there's less disturbance and if managed correctly we can manage it potentially more efficiently than we can with the the woodland habitat but also making sure that we can retain that woodland habitat in places where it's safe to do so so I took the, the the last 200 in one slide this is the next 15 years of where we're at and we are looking at that biodiversity action plan later this year. We will have the, the initial habitat baseline by the end of this year. And as we go forward, recommendations within the review are to be able to report on the state of our estate every year, and then looking to be compliant with new standards by the end of 21. And then having that annual reporting will enable us to move towards understanding um, the biodiversity known at loss status of the network by the end of 2024. And as I say, we were set a 2040 target for biodiversity net gain, but we've actually brought that forward as part of our ambition so that we can achieve that by 2035. And that I'll leave a nice, was, I did used to have a sunny photo. There's a nice rainy photo of the railway uh, and the, uh, the view from the trains. And any questions? Thanks, Neil. Yeah, we've got some come through. So the first one is, what's Network's rail position for st strategic plans? Does this get put on the actual planning application development or is there a need for biodiversity net gain at a strategic level? In which case, can credits be used at a strategic level? 
Easy question to start with. Thank you. So from a, a strategic point of view, we, we're looking, we need to understand what biodiversity we have and how we can then fit that into the plans. The, the majority of the work that takes place across the railway is the, is the routine maintenance work. There are large scale programs and projects that take place as well to get that in, to understand the, the, the impact that those may have as well. We do have to go through planning in some instances, but other times we, we don't have to do the same planning being a statutory undertaker. So it is something that we're looking at to understand what we have and then we can move forward with the strategies. And that's part of my new role. It's a role that's just been started within the organisation. We have a, a new environmental sustainability strategy. We now have a biodiversity strategy manager to go with that. And so that is going to be something I'll be taking forwards. That's great. Thanks, Neil. So the next question is, will Network Rail be moving to the use of UK HAB from phase one? Yes. <laughs> we basically, yes, we, we did have, so we've worked, I mean, we worked with Julia for some time on the, we used to have a network our biodiversity calculator. We're taking on board the use of the, um, the biodiversity metric 2.0, and we'll be using that going forwards. That's great. Thank you. So just in terms of the metrics, how does that apply to Scotland as well? So the metric, as uh, Neil was mentioning and as Joe was asking, is based on using uh, UK HAB as, a, as a, a, a way of identifying habitat types. It can be applied in Scotland. Uh, there's no reason why it couldn't. I know some Scottish companies are already uh, looking to work with it, like SSE. Currently, though, the legislation I was referring to only applies to England. So it depends on, on what Scotland chooses to do in terms of policy and legislation, etc. But in terms of how the metric itself operates, it could work across the United Kingdom. That's great. Thanks very much, Nick. So the next question is for Neil. How do Network Rail um, identify what species are present? If it's at a local level, then we will have people doing local surveys if prior to projects taking place. The remote sensing won't be going down to the species level, it'd be looking, it'd be stopping at the habitat level. But if it's, you know, we do have people, we do have surveys take place on the network. So if we need to identify species, we'll do start off with desktop studies. I saw that there was a question about local record centers. Yes, we do use local record centers. We are trying to build up relationships with, with the, all the local record centers to understand what is there. And then if we need to go to site, we will undertake surveys safely for that with the ecologists on site. That's great. Thank you. And is the target for Network Rail to have the 10% net gain in place, was it by 2035? We have to achieve biodiversity net gain by 2035, yes. We, the, there was not a percentage mark put on that achievement. Once we know what net is, then we'll be able to look at the, the mark. But it's, it's likely to be something like that, yes. That's great, thanks. And, and just one here from where can we download the latest biodiversity net gain metric 2.0? So just very quickly, Imogen, if you, it's on the Natural England Products and Publications catalogue. Uh, easiest way, if you Google Biodiversity Metric 2.0, that will take you to the page and you can download it and the guidance documents. As I said, the updated, yeah, kind of revised version of it will be available from December and that should be in the same place. And you should also be able to access it via gov.uk as well. That's great. Thanks so much. For Neil. How does Network Rail consider natural corridors? We've got 20,000 miles of them across Britain. We run trains up to 125 miles an hour through the middle of them with 25,000 volts of AC electricity in some places. So we, we have natural corridors. We are looking at how we can, using the habitat analysis together with connectivity assessments that we're getting from CEH, we will then be better to understand not only our corridors, but those that we go through the middle of and so that connectivity and that that will be something then when we're planning works we'll be able to better plan so that we can make sure we can undertake the vegetation management that we need to do but also do it in such a way that it it helps with the connectivity from sites either side of the railway. That's great thanks and another question here so how does Network Rail embed the Varley review that you were speaking about earlier? We do that through briefings to the staff. It is something, it's been 18 months now since John Varley published the review. Actually, it's longer than that, it's two years, two years in November. So we are 
taking forward the recommendations, we have a specific program that is looking at not only the biodiversity elements that were raised by John Barley, but also other issues like weather resilience and climate change and also the energy use and decarbonisation of the railway. These are all within two programmes that we are running and they are network-wide programmes. So there are staff from across the business who are involved in these programmes. So we've taken what John Varley has put to us and uh, have taken it up a level so that we've got the programme doing the work. It's involving not only the mapping of the biodiversity, but also improving the capability, the competency of the staff we have, and making sure also that our contractors, when they're coming on to the network, also understand what we're trying to achieve. Great, thank you. Next question is, is it quite habitat focused as opposed to species focused? What's your outlook? Do you do you prioritise on species or habitat? The way that we're monitoring the biodiversity to start with is going to be at the habitat level because of the the approach to having the, the extent of the network and being able to do that to give us those those metrics to start with. When we then start to do the work at a local level, that's when we, we will pick up the species impacts that we may have and then tailor the work accordingly. So how it, it, it's hopefully a gradation that will take us through understanding what the habitats are and then when we start ground truthing, understanding what species are in those habitats. That's great. I think that's probably all we've got time for now. So thanks so much, Neil. That was great. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers. So with that, just like to say a massive thanks to everyone. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Neil and Julia and Nick. And hope that you found it helpful. Thanks, Imogen. Thanks for, for running this. Thank program. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.